But I remember an old timer in my field one time said, Rick, if you want to influence people, there are two rules you got to remember. Rule number one is shut up. And rule number two, never forget rule number one. All right. Fantastic. Look, uh, as, as we all know through life, right? Change is inevitable. Change is constant. So I'm super excited today to have with me, Rick Maurer. He is an expert on, on change. He's an author, speaker, consultant, has worked with some very, very big name companies that uh, you would know. You may even know him from some media outlets and publications. He's been around for several decades as an expert in this space, change, effective change, effectuating change as a leader. Uh, so Rick, super excited to have you on today. Welcome. Thanks, Michael. It's good to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to this conversation. Change is something that I've run a lot of projects at an enterprise level. Uh, we all realize that, that change is, uh, well, what's the opposite of change, right? Stagnation and, and sort of yeah. slow death, right? Change is a, is a positive thing if we really think about it. This is evolution. But for some reason, it's so hard for organizations and, and, and particularly hard for leaders that want to do this effectively. So yeah. how did you get into this space? Well, this is going to sound like a long story. I promise you it's not. When I got out of, I was going to be a musician and I did that for a little while and then realized there were the people I really admire, they, they were, in, they're in a different species than me. I mean, I could get pretty good, but I couldn't get at that level of Miles Davis or the head of first trumpet in the Chicago Symphony. And I realized I better think of something else. And at any rate, I was in graduate school and was studying to work with emotionally disturbed kids in schools. And the philosophy of this program I was in was radical at the time. I didn't realize it, but it was radical. And it was, a lot of these kids aren't disturbed. It's the schools that are disturbed. And if you can change the system, you'll have fewer kids acting up, acting crazy. And the idea is that I would get a job as a teacher, but basically I'd be there to change the school system and not, I mean, a real, you know, Machiavellian kind of thing. The, the idea behind it was good, but the techniques were not quite so good. So you can imagine no experience at all, other than student teaching a little bit. And I walk into a school and all the teachers there had like at least 20 years experience. I got none and I go, hi, I'm here to help. <laughs> you know, and they'll go, well, that's nice young man, you know, at the moment we need some help, we'll call on you. You know, I mean, it was almost that bad. But I started noticing something that when I would be in meetings, uh, faculty meetings, I'd say something and people go, okay, yeah. Somebody else would say it. Like this Michael guy would say it. People go, oh, that's great. Tell me more about it. And I kept wondering what is going on. And so I started blaming the schools and I started blaming the people I worked with. And then I don't know why this happened. Then I thought, huh, maybe it's me, you know, you know, maybe it's not the schools that are these benighted institutions that couldn't do anything. Maybe, maybe it's me. And I, so I got really interested in this whole notion of change and conflict and leadership and influence. And I had, after about eight years, I, I left teaching and I went into consulting. And as I started working with some clients, they started talking about change and they would inevitably talk about resistance to change. And I had been studying some martial arts at the time, uh, typically uh, Dai Chi and uh, Aikido, which are both martial arts that really don't have attacking moves. That you use the energy coming at you, you know, and I, I liked that and I liked what I was kind of reading about mastery and that and the stuff I was reading in the business press just seemed wrong to me. In fact, I did a literature search back in the early 90s on resistance to change in organizations. And there was a verb that was attached to the word resistance almost always, and that was overcome. We need to overcome resistance. Now that's, I understand that, that's tempting. The problem is the moment I try to overcome your resistance, I'm gonna get more resistance. You know, think about you're, have, you're sitting down to dinner and you've got a, a, somebody calling you, wanting to sell you something. I mean, and they go, no, but wait a minute. You know, you're not getting any younger. I mean, it just, it's, it's a bad approach. And so the more I looked at what I was learning in martial arts and some other places, and then started studying Gestalt psychology, I, I just found a different way of looking at it. And out of that developed my own theory. And basically is the, the, the whole notion of we need to respect 
the resistance because people are resisting for a reason. They're not born resistors. There aren't people who get out of bed in the morning, their feet hit the ground and go, ah, whose day can I mess up today? I mean, now I know some of your viewers are going, no, no, I know that. I know who he's talking about. But, but the fact is we, we resist in response to something. And so how do we respect the person resisting, respect ourselves in the process and have a good conversation? And that's what I got interested in. And I ended up writing a book about it. And I started getting, this is 1996, I started getting phone calls because of it. And people said, hey, could you come help us? And I was, I was actually afraid to write the book because that was what I was saying was so different than anything else I'd been reading. And fortunately, uh, a friend of mine, Ellie Hook, said, Rick, you do realize you're resisting coming out with a book on resistance, right? You get, you get the irony of this, <laughs> Maurer, you idiot. And, and she was right. And it got me to laugh. And so you know, I, had to, I, I said to the publisher, OK, we're ready. Let's do it. And so And it changed my, the book changed my life. So. That's fantastic. It, it's so odd that you know, someone writing a book might say, well, I, I, I'm hesitant to publish this book because it's so different. And then you have someone else, I'm hesitant to publish this book because I think there are so many others just like it, right? Or, yes, right. Uh, right? Or uh, I, I'm too young to, to lead change and innovation. I'm not seasoned in the industry yet. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have the seasoned man or woman saying, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm still having imposter syndrome. <laughs> yes, so, yeah. I don't know why we do this to ourselves. You know, when you started to describe working with emotionally disturbed, I, I thought you were going to somehow say executives are emotionally disturbed. And we, we may be, we may be. Well, but, there goes my client base. I think. Right. So. <laughs> well, hey, there's always work to do. Hey, and that's the whole self-mastery thing, right? It's a continuous journey. I, I love how martial arts parallel uh, that self-improvement journey. I was just having a conversation with somebody yesterday on a, on a hike that, that martial arts, you know, overtly, it's a, it's a physical self-defense practice, potentially. It's certainly a bit of a mental meditative practice, but it, yeah. but it really is a, a self-improvement practice. So yes. I, I love that you found some insight in a, in a metaphor of martial arts to think about resistance in, in an organizational change capacity. It was really, yeah, it was very, very helpful in that way. I mean, it's never, uh, you know, if I met somebody in an alley, I would not remember any moves. But what I learned philosophically has been really helpful and as a kind of a way of approaching people just, right. just in general. So, yeah. Yeah, interesting. So that, uh, that, that first book that focused on resistance, I'd love to talk about this and what we do as yeah. leaders to, to deal with resistance to change. But going back to your days in the school system and, and trying to be a change agent from within yeah. versus a consultant, right, which is usually an external right. party. That's exactly right. Did you, in, in all that and your, your reflection and sort of self-analysis, did you end up figuring out what your own resistance was that wasn't making you as effective as you wanted to be in that situation? Yeah, uh, arrogance. I mean, honest, honestly, it, uh, I remember I had two years experience. I was teaching in a very large school system. And I came up with this idea how they could improve education for kids in elementary school. So we're talking about thousands and thousands of kids. I've got two years experience. And so I write a proposal. Nobody asked me to do this. Nobody's saying, Rick, you've got brilliant ideas. I write a proposal and send it to the superintendent. And this, <laughs> you know, I think back on that and go, you idiot. And so I sent it to them. Of course, you know, because I you know, was, was a teacher and uh, the, they had a pretty strong union in the school system that they said, well, we would love to meet with Mr. Maurer. And so the superintendent of an instruction met with me. And so I go in and I start telling him what's wrong with the system they got and how my ideas are based on the famed, I said, the famed, uh, the eminent uh, Swiss child psychologist, Jean Piaget. And I start talking and he says, uh, Mr. Maurer, it may surprise you to know that we've known about Dr. Piaget's work for quite some time. And he might as well have said, and don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> well, so for a while, I thought, oh, see, you can't change systems. They're a bunch of old, they're blah. And it, it took me a while. I mean, it took me, God, I don't know when it happened, but probably uh, on my next job, I thought, oh, what was I thinking? I had two years experience, so I have no credibility. Nobody knows me. Nobody's saying, hey, you really ought to listen to Rick. He's really doing some stuff to help us. None of that. I just try to go in thinking that my idea is brilliant. 
And therefore, you're going to recognize the brilliance of this idea. And, and a lot of us in organizations do exactly the same thing. We go, oh, we got to do this. And suddenly, it takes on a life of itself. And then we're surprised when people, she's, I'm really sorry. I'd like to hear more about that, Michael. But I, I got, you know, it's like, um, it just took me a while to realize the biggest problem in getting my ideas across was Rick Maurer and no one else. I love that. Yeah, there's so much sort of victim mentality out there these days. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if we're implicitly or explicitly learning this and teaching this, but you know, this happened or this didn't happen because of, yes. you know, X external to me versus well, let me first look within. Where is that? Where is that friction or where is that shortcoming or where is that? I love that yes. you mentioned arrogance or, or maybe, maybe ego. So another quick story from this, this hike I did for charity. Yeah. So this, this is, this is organized. I know you, you love to do some hiking too. So yeah. 24 hour, put as many miles as we can in and we we're raising money for a charity. And the, the gentleman who organized it is a super intense former Marine, like comes across as Marine drill sergeant, right, you know, right. that huge personality, yeah. definitely like a lead from a re, lead from the front, very vocal sort of a leader. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he involved his family, his wife, and he has two young children, maybe eight and 10, seven, 10, something yeah. like that. So they were along for the overnight 24 hour effort. Wow. And he had, a, he had a really cool recap today in hindsight going, you know, there came a point in time where I'm there. I organized it. I'm leading it. He's saying, but I took a few laps off. I think he might've taken one lap off to be with his kids. They needed oh. to rest a little bit and to allow his wife to get a, get a lap in to see the sunrise. And so, oh. so you know, it's all ego based, right? I, I had to sort of put my own, my own ego or my own desire to rack up the most miles or, or lead from the front or be as manly as the next guy or whatever it was. And and make a yeah. choice that was in the sort of greater good or service to my, my children, wow. my, my wife, my family. That's, that's a wonderful story. And I, and first of all, it gives a lot of respect for people being out front and leading and taking a stance, but having the humanity to, to, <laughs> to realize there's more to the picture than that. And, and I think that gets lost sometimes. And sometimes we, we kind of discount that forceful leader, like the, the former Marine out there. When in fact, uh, Marines can do spectacular work, and but 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 when I've seen leaders who can do can be strong leaders and pay attention to the people around them at the same time, it's that's a very powerful combination. Yeah, I suppose we've been talking about it as emotional intelligence the last last few decades. Yeah. And, and you've so you've been around this corporate change aspect for the last you know, several decades. It just makes me think when, when you said that, I think back to um, this guy, Al Dunlap, Chainsaw Al Dunlap was one of the, I don't know, 80s, 90s, you know, very hard charging. You bring this yep. guy in to just cut thing, cut the fat, right? Trim things down, transact, uh, that sort of a leader. And, and for a time, that was, uh, that was the trend that was sort of embraced, you know, these sort of guys that didn't really have any EQ, didn't care about humanity, didn't care about employees. And that was maybe one extreme. Yeah, uh, my sense out in the consulting world and with some clients these days is is maybe we're maybe we swung to another extreme where we've got so much emphasis on culture and happiness and humanity and employees, uh, employment satisfaction and and retention that uh, something like a big organizational change project or program that's disruptive, right and and. and it yeah. gets back to change to resistance, right? That that might be seen as contrary to employee satisfaction and happiness at work and hours put in and all those kind of things. So how, how do you navigate change when you do have such an emphasis on culture and people? Well, uh, first of all, my experience uh, is, doesn't match yours. That doesn't mean that either of us are wrong, but in my experience, uh, there's a lot of talk about the humanity and the Kind of thing. I don't see it in practice nearly as much as people talk about it. So people do training and, you know, there's a lot of talk about emotional intelligence and all that, but, but I don't see it in practice as much as I would like. Um, and when I see it done well, I really see a nice combination of that attention to people and clear leadership. If, can I tell you a quick story? Please. Okay. 
there's a small uh, company called Rhino Foods, like rhinoceros, rhino. And the guy who owns it, uh, a guy named Ted Castle, I assume, I think he's still in charge. Uh, it's a, it's a co company that makes dessert ingredients. So they sell to vendors like ice cream makers and that, but they don't sell to the public. And it's, it's a family owned business. And they, he held a meeting with every employee. It was like 90 employees. And he said, we, there's a downturn in the market and I've done everything I know how to do to cut costs. And the only thing left is to lay off people. And he said, we have never done that before. I really don't want to have to do it, but I think, I, frankly, I've tried everything I know to do. And he said, and so, you know, starting whenever, Monday or two weeks from now, here's what we're going to have to do. But then he said, look, I think I've thought of everything, but if you can think of anything that might help us actually save money or bring more revenues in, I, am, I will seriously consider it. 90 employees, he got 111 suggestions. And so he pulled some people together and say, let's make sense of that. And they ended up, I think, with like five themes out of that, like uh, basically hiring out a lot of their skilled employees to other similar kind of companies for, for a while. They didn't have to lay off anybody. Two years later, the, there was a downturn in the industry again. They pulled that off the shelf and they did it again. So to me, that was an example of a leader who really said, to keep this place open, we have got this, this is our revenue picture. This is what we've got to have, but he's willing to be influenced, but it's not a big meeting. If 90 people sitting around in a meeting and say, yeah, okay, Mary, you go, okay, you go. I mean, and two weeks later, you're still talking. It's not that kind of thing. That's, um, I've worked in places where that's been the case and it's this illusion that it's actually being respectful to people. I think it's a waste of time. And I think it actually insults people. So I think you can combine both of them, but the key really is finding a way to, to combine kind of the strength of this, this is where we're gonna go with the willingness to be influenced and make that all part of a single process. And that's what I've been working on lately. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, that really takes, uh, takes humility to, to yes. be able to ask for that. I, uh, you, you know, you and I talked a little bit off air about the demographic and, and some of the focus of this show. I'll generalize here uh, for men and say that yes. we're, we're often not very good at asking for help. Maybe that goes back to ego and, and humility or something along those lines. I, I, I love what you said there in terms of process. I, I find so many organizations try to try to accomplish that inclusion by these meetings that get bigger and longer right. and, and decision by consensus versus the other thing that came up for me in your story was the old phrase that none of us is smarter than all of us, right? That, uh, that yeah. the wisdom of, of that team. So what's the, what, what happened in, in that scenario as an, as an example that became change that the, the team embraced together that put aside resistance to change and united them versus you know, not getting support as a leader. What happened there? Well, he, I think he would have gotten support because he owned the company. I mean, people would have taken it, but I think there would have been, when I've been around places that have had big downsizing, you know, uh, that it something happens to the people who are left, there's almost a survivor syndrome. So there can be, there can be a, a, a payoff that you really don't want to have. Um, so I think I'm losing the point. Could ask the question yeah, yeah, yeah. again, please. Yeah, no, that, 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 that in itself was an interesting point that uh, oftentimes you end up losing the, the, the employees that are most mobile, that are in high demand, you know, yeah. ha have an ability to, to kind of migrate. But I, I know you, uh, I probably phrased the question uh, in, in the context of that story, not in the best way, but I know some of the things you focus on uh, in change leadership is why people support us and why people tend to resist ideas right. or change. So can you speak on that? Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, you know, it's funny when I really have been looking at trying to, trying to write about this, to talk about it with my clients, I was learning a lot in the field of psychology and there's just a lot of psychobabble. You know, and I can, and I was doing a lot of work with engineers, chemical engineers at the time. And I realized I could not go into a meeting with these chemical engineers and go, you know, 
The problem is introjection, I believe. And they're going to go, what? what? What are you talking? I mean, you know, you just don't do that. And I thought, all right, how do I talk about this in a way that doesn't dumb it down, but talks about it in a way that's uh, respectful to, to their language? And I was really pretty stuck and, and I would sit and, and I like writer's block, by the way, it's talk, talk about resistance because I know something's churning. So I just trust that. At any rate, I, the more I thought about it, I thought basically there are three kind of major reasons why people resist us. And the, the first one, I call them levels. I wish I had never called them levels because it makes it appear like they appear in order. You know, uh, and that's just not what I meant was level one is the easiest one to work with. Level two is harder. And if, so here's here's what they are. And then I'll tell you the positive side of those. OK, level one is I don't get it. I don't understand what you're saying. OK, so there's no deep psychological stuff. I just don't understand it. You know, you're in from accounting. I work in information technology. I do not understand this language you're talking. You know, it can be that simple. And and so getting over level one can be an easy thing like, oh, I've got to make sure that I use the right language or whatever, whatever. By the way, one of the problems is kind of a quick aside is that often we make the mistake of thinking that all resistance is level one. And so you're, you're sitting there not understanding it. I go, oh, I'll explain it again. And, <laughs> and as soon as you do that, you're, you're starting to insult the intelligence of that other person, you know? So, so level one is certainly one form of resistance. So level two is I don't like it. And this is, this is fear. So it's not like, oh, I don't like Brussels sprouts. It's, it's a survival thing. I mean, the, uh, the amygdala fires, it's fight, flight. It's like, it's survival. I could lose my job. You know? And that kicks in like with in under a second, it kicks in way, way before our rational brain gets involved. So for instance, let's say that this podcast that we're both on, let's say everybody watching this and listening to this is part of the team. And you say, so I'm turning it over to Rick now because he's gonna talk about our plans for the future. And I start talking about something and I say, and I use the word downsizing. Suddenly, <laughs> you know, Everybody on the call, they, they make sure they're on mute. They make sure their, their face can't be seen. I mean, all of that. And there are people go, oh, wait a minute, wait, I just, I just, we got a kid in college. I, I can't get a job. You know, I'm in my late 50s. What am I going to do? You know, that, all that's going on. In the very next sentence, I say, you know, downsizing has happened to a lot of companies, but we're not going to do that here. But you don't hear that because your brain is already occupied with, oh my God, what's happening in my life. Level two is a big deal, and it's 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 a big deal simply because it's a big deal. But the bigger the big problem with it is, we don't have language to talk about emotions in the workplace. So let's say it's your meeting, and and go, Rick, you you put your hand up in the chat room, and, I go, and uh, I'm not going to say, uh, Michael, I'm having a level two reaction to what you're saying. You know that I'll say. Um, could you go back to the last slide? I have a question about the time projections. Oh, good, I can answer that. Well, how about, how about uh, you know, the second quarter, the, the things you're talking about with expenditures there, it's all level one stuff. So we had this great conversation. Afterwards, somebody says, hey, how'd the, meal, the, the meeting go? And you go, great. They asked good questions. I gave you know, good answers. And everybody's acting in good faith. The problem is the conversations up here, what's going on is really, down here for the person asking. That's a huge problem. And it gets in the way of a lot of projects. So at level two, doesn't mean that leaders give into all that fear, but they have to treat people with respect. And, and that's, anyway, so I don't get it, I don't like it. Level three is I don't like you. And this base, it's an overstatement, but basically it means I don't have trust and confidence in you to lead something like this. You know, so. You might go, well, no, Rick's a nice guy. Yeah, no, I love it when we go out to lunch and we both like, like hiking, we talk about that. Oh, so you're gonna follow him on this. What are you, nuts? The guy, you know, he, he, goes, he goes off, he reads a book, he comes up with some idea, two months later, he forgets about it and moves on to something else. You know, he's a basket case, you know, leader. So that can be level three. Uh, as 
when I work outside the United States, I, I live here in the States, and if somebody says, and we brought a consultant in to work with us, as soon as they say a consultant, people are starting to go into level two, like, oh my God, what's happening? And then they say, and he's from the United States. They go, oh, no. <laughs> and he's written a book. Oh, my. You know, it's just all this stuff. It's a trifecta of, of bad stuff. And so immediately, there's this picture painted of who I am. Now, I cannot say, hey, by the way, I'm not like those other consultants. I mean, that just doesn't take you anywhere. I don't probably don't remember this, but Richard Nixon, I think it was when he was vice president, went on TV and said, trust me, I'm not a crook. You know, I don't care if you're a crook or not. That's just not a good line to use because people, you know, it's like you, you're going to start a used car place and you call it Honest John's. I mean, it's just, if you got to use the word honest in front of it, it's not going to work. So what I have to do when I'm working outside the U.S., and I do it in the U.S. as well, is I have to demonstrate that I'm different than their perceptions. So like one thing for a consultant, consultants love to come in and show off their models to show that they really know their stuff. And, you know, I, I love the stuff I've come up with. I would love to, you know, I could bore people forever. And I found I was far more successful at saying, hey, you know, I, I really appreciate those of you who have responded prior to my coming here today. And do you know that 92% of you said, blah, 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 blah. Like, huh. And, you know, and in my experience in a lot of organizations, that a number like that is, that's, that's really actually pretty high. I think that's gonna work in your favor, but I'm using their data. And I'm not just making up crap there. I mean, I'm really using it. And it, it doesn't turn things around miraculously, but it can often get people to go, well, maybe he's not so bad. I'll, I'll, you know, and that's, man, that, that's an opening. That's a great opening. And as long as I don't blow it, then it can keep moving that way. So what you're looking for is people need to get it. They need to like it. In other words, they need to be enthusiastic. Like, hey, tell me more. And three, they need to trust us enough to go, I know it sounds scary, but Michael's a good guy. I'm going to follow him on this. So, those are yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you migrated into that story because as you were describing level one, or sorry, level two, the amygdala hijack. I definitely thought of the word consultant as something that could trigger that reaction. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the other thing I guess I thought of as you went to level three, and and again thinking about it in terms of of a consultant who's generally there for a relatively short period of time deploy some domain expertise, try to make an impact quick, quickly, effectively. And this idea of building trust and confidence, I, I suppose you, my question is going to be, how do you do that, particularly in a time frame? Uh, I mean, you answered a little bit of this, but maybe, maybe if you have more, you'd like to expound on how yes. to accomplish that quickly and effectively as a consultant. I, I think what I heard in your example was rather than coming in spouting, hey, here's what I know and my credentials, it sounds like you go into engagements, trying to set up some uh, meaning, meaning projects or work, create some engagement with that employee community before you even get there. So you can start to have more of a dialogue than a, than a monologue when you do, do show up. Yes, it, that's all true. There's another thing that I do, and it's just because of the, the way I work as a consultant. I never lead a change inside a org, uh, client's organization. I mean, I know some consultants do that, and I, I have nothing against it, but I'm there basically to support the change process and like who, generally whoever that leader or that leadership team is, uh, and they can say, hey, we got a meeting coming up next Monday and it's really gonna go badly, uh, what, what can we do? And so we talk about that. And then sometimes I will come in and I'll, I'll work with them uh, in the meeting. And I'm like, like one of the things I do uh, like when I would go out to learn stuff like on a, in a plant, uh, I realized don't, don't ask people to come to headquarters bu building and meet with you in a, in a meeting room. It'd be really convenient for me. I could talk to more people, but I could build more credibility by going out on the floor, leaning against a machine and talking to those people. I mean, it's just, it's a different quality of conversation. Uh, I remember one time it was a chemical plant and I was out on the floor and I just said, hey, there's been a lot of talk about safety protocols here. What, any take on that? <laughs> and they said, um, yeah, this, it's just talk. And I said, well, it seemed, you know, when I talked to senior leaders, it seemed to be pretty serious. And he said, 
look, we got big problems here. And I don't even think it, the problems ever even get up to senior leaders. And I said, well, do others agree with this, what he's saying? And one, and, and we've, one guy said, Rick, you see all these tanks around here? These are filled with volatile chemicals. If a spark got to any one of those, this building would not exist. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. And I said, uh, oh, one, and one guy leaned to me and goes, Rick, they, oh, you, I messed up the timing here. This guy said, Rick, things are going to go boom. And, and, you know, and like an idiot, I go, oh, what do you mean boom? And, and the other guy said, you know, we got all these coming. But they, if I was in an official meeting, they probably wouldn't use the phrase, things are going to go boom. But it was really powerful. And when I went back to the senior leaders, without ever mentioning where I picked this up, I said, look, I was asking some people about this, the safety protocols. People are really skeptical. They don't think you guys hear it. In fact, one person said, and I wrote it on a flip chart, not put it on PowerPoint. I said, things are going to go boom. And you could see these engineers who were just used to these polite meetings. I remember the plant manager kind of sitting back and going, whoa. And I remember walking back to headquarters with her and she said, that, that was really, really helpful. So you, one, one of the cool things about being out on the floor is you, you hear language that you wouldn't hear. Sometimes I have to clean it up, but the lang I mean, you hear language that you wouldn't hear in a more formal meeting. And, that, and it also, if I allow people to talk the way they want to talk, which is basically what I like, I mean, I like that kind of conversation, it, it can start to build trust. So. Yeah, that, I think uh, that feels intuitively familiar to me that, that if you were just one piece of that that came across for me was engaging somebody sort of on their own turf rather than having yes. them come somewhere else that they're maybe defensive about or unfamiliar or, or anxious right. about. It, it did make me think a little bit about the, the old uh, the movie uh, Office Space. I don't know if you ever saw oh. a <laughs> hilarious comedy, but there's so much. I'm looking like for a real life stapler right now. Yeah, yeah, like a real life Dilbert cartoon, you know. And, and and people are walking in. The Bobs are in the office, you know, calling, beckoning employees to them. And the one guy walks in. And he says, "Hey, you know, good luck with your firings." Right? It's like that's how people feel. They feel like they're they're going to the altar and uh, they're going to get struck down. God, that's yeah. I. It's been a while since I've seen the movie. I really, I really like it. So it's, <laughs> it's got, it's got great stuff in it. Yeah. What's the, um, you know, maybe, maybe change itself is, is one of those amygdala hijack kind of words, you know, if, if it's carried a, a negative thought for a lot of people, I, I know you have a new book out called season yeah. moments of possibility to me, possibility is definitely a very positive uh, sort of word. How, how has that evolved? What's, what's the new book about? What's the focus? Well, well, every, everything I do is based on those three levels. I mean, that, that's the foundation piece. I mean, I, I keep thinking of nuances to it. But ba and this new book is basically, how do you bring the positive side of those three levels of support? How do you bring it alive? Uh, when What I find out is that when I ask clients, I go, how important is it for you to build support for change? And usually they say, oh, very important. But then they don't do it. And I really started looking at that pretty seriously. And this is where the book came from. And, and I thought, you know, it's not a lack of skills. It's not a lack of resources. There's tons of good resources out there. I mean, I got a couple shelves just filled with some really decent books, not stuff I wrote, you know, but, uh, the, uh, but, but stuff that, you know, can be really helpful. And I thought the big problem, the one big problem is that we separate the change management, the human part of it from the actual work. So we have all these planning meetings and then if we have time, we'll bring in pizza. Or if there's time, there'll be question and answer. And there's nothing wrong with pizza. There's nothing wrong with question and answer. But what I'm playing with in this book is how do, how do we blend in the human part into everything we do? And let me give you a couple of examples. This is really simple, but it really starts with this really simple stuff. Um, I have a, had a client who was a, a nuclear physicist. I did not advise him on nuclear fission, by the way, so the country is safe. Um, but he said where he worked, if he had an idea, he needed to get the support of the scientific community where he worked. And he said, the way you do that, there's a 
I don't know, a Monday afternoon meeting, let's say, and you come in and you present and you have to use slides. He said, the rule is, it's, it's an unwritten rule, but if you don't use slides, people go, oh, he didn't prepare. And he said, and so we talk because he knows that I don't think PowerPoint's a good tool if you're trying to influence people. I mean, it, there's some things it does really well, but basically that's not a good tool for it. And he called me a couple of weeks later and he said, I figured it out. He said, I, I, typically for a presentation like this, where I was trying to get the scientists to go, wow, we ought to move ahead with that. We ought to give it the go ahead. He said, a presentation like that would probably be 50 slides. He said, which means I'm doing a lot of talking. Just to, and I thought, what's the minimum number of slides I could use? And everybody would still say, I'm prepared. And he said, it was five. He said, here's the amazing thing. I covered all the same material, but because I wasn't constantly reading from slides, there was a lot more room for conversation. And what happened is people started getting engaged and they would talk with me and they would start building on what I was doing. So it wasn't all his stuff. So by the end of the meeting, there was a lot of energy, a lot of excitement about the idea. And now it's the same meeting late in the afternoon on Monday, you know, the, the same meeting room, the same bad coffee. The only thing that changed, she said, you know, is there a way that I, could, that I could bring people into the mix better? I mean, it can be that, you can start kind of at that simple level. And, but and, but the, as soon as we start to say, oh yeah, but there's this great three day event we could add, you know, and, which can be really helpful things. That's not the place to start. The place to start is how do I take that conference call that's usually a sleeper and make it a way of actually asking for input. Hey, this is what we're thinking of doing. And I would really like some, I've, I've got to go back to the executive team. I really would like your ideas. I mean, I, I don't, I, I promise you, I will bring up the ideas. I'm not making a promise what's going to happen as a result. And if you suddenly, if you start to go, you know, Rick, no, Rick's serious about that, suddenly the meetings take, can take a different shape. It's like, hey, I've got a voice here. Um, can I tell you one other story? Please, yeah. Right. Okay. It's a huge company, uh, over 100,000 people. They have a, uh, a management program that would run a few times a year, and they would bring in people, the real up-and-coming kind of junior managers, the people they really thought these people are the future of our company. And they would run them through some training at headquarters, and then they would go out to one of the facilities, and then they would, they would go a couple of other places, but it was a big deal. And so I taught in the uh, program that was in headquarters. And every one of these programs that started, the chief operating officer kicked it off. Now, so there's six, about 60 participants. He, he's COO of a company that's like in the fortune 20 or something. I mean, this is a big place. So for him to just come is a big deal. You know, um, he could easily have sent somebody else and said, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll call the guy, Jim, Jim, you know, really sorry. Couldn't be here, but everybody's been in those meetings when Jim couldn't be here. Da, 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 da. And, but he, he said, the reason I want to be here is you men and women are the future of our company. And I just, I just want to say, thank you. I appreciate you taking your time, being here, and I've got an hour with you. I, I'm really excited about that, and I want to give you a choice. I've got the PowerPoint show that we use for Wall Street, and it explains where we are in the market, what our comp competition looks like. He said, it's a very good slide presentation, and I'm happy just to sit down and you can, we can watch that. He said, or we don't have to turn the computer on. I can just field your questions for the next hour. I was in the back of the room maybe 20 times when he did that for different classes. Never once did the group say, show us the PowerPoint, ever. So here's what they would do, taking level one, two, and three. <clears throat> here's the COO. This person could make or break your career. So you're thinking about, well, I got a level two question. I got a level three question. That's not where people start. They'll go, hey, uh, Jim, a lot of talk about that July 15th initiative. When will that be starting? They'll go, well, that'll be on July 15th. I mean, it isn't that obvious, but it's that close. So people are asking slow pitch softball questions and they, they're realizing the guy's not insulting them. He's answering them and things would start to heat up. Well, there's a, a concept in that company 
called horizontal integration. They're the merger of a lot of different companies and so a lot of different cultures. <clears throat> and so it was a real challenge uh, when you know this group was supposed to be working with that group. I, I, honestly, Michael, I'm not gonna exaggerate this at all. So in the middle of the room, guy raises his hand and Jim goes, yeah. The guy looks at him and goes, what are you guys doing about horizontal integration? Honestly, honestly <laughs> this guy does not know, know the, the phrase career limiting move. You know, it's just, I mean, it was just, I mean, other people are looking like, what are you doing? Jim easily could have cut him down. Sure. And I don't think there's anybody there who would have blamed him. But he said, you know, you, you're asking a very good question. <clears throat> I wish I had a very good answer and I don't. He said, I can tell you, we talk about this a lot. It's a big deal. He said, you know, you just, just you asking the question, let's, let's know if this is a big deal. And he said, we keep playing with ideas and nothing has come to us that is very good. And he steps back and he said, if any of you have any ideas at all, please tell me, I need fresh ideas. I, and I really, I, I would really love to hear what you have to say. So, and, and then they go on to the rest of the questions. So one time I, they, they come back to the, the classroom and I said, how many of you, that's, this is the first time you ever saw Jim live. And for most people that was true. And I said, <clears throat> if he walked in right now and said, hey folks, I got, a, I got this idea that I think is gonna be really good for the company, but I gotta tell you, I just haven't had a chance to think about it with the level of detail I want. And what I want is I wanna get a cadre of people who I can trust. And that maybe we just pretty much, you full time are gonna work on this for the next nine months. He said, I wish I could tell you more, but I just don't know. And I said, so he comes in and that's what he tells you. You know, uh, <clears throat> I said, would any of you volunteer? And most people said, oh yeah. And I go, now, wait a minute. At level one, he doesn't even know what it is. And at level two, you don't know if it's gonna be good for your career. It could be in some basement somewhere and nobody will ever see it. And, and they said, yeah. And I, and I said, well, so why would you do it? And they said, we trust him. And, and look how he handles himself out. The guy knows a lot. He's open to being influenced. You know, I'm willing to take a chance. So it's, it's a, on one hand, it's a really tiny thing but it really speaks to character and that respect for other people. <clears throat> now, I'm not suggesting that leaders can just get by on charm and I don't think they should, <clears throat> but if you've got that solid relationship, people are more likely to give you the benefit of the doubt uh, and they're more likely to tell you things that they might not otherwise tell you that could be really, really helpful. So, so the whole book is about, so how do we find those moments just to blend them in? Yeah, I love both of those stories and, and those examples, the uh, the trust element of the way he handled that and, and built trust. And gosh, who wouldn't who wouldn't follow that leader? Right. Yes. Right. Right. And, and then the one of the things that struck me in, in your first story there was you mentioned energy and carrying that energy into the fold of the regular routine. I see so many of you know, offsite, say we're going to do a full day offsite, half day, three day offsite, and we're going to have golf shirts and, and balloons and, and lunch. And, oh, right? sure. but, I forgot about golf shirts. Let me put that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> right, which is fantastic. You know, a lot of times great <laughs> ideas come out of those things. You can build relationships. Yeah. There's no, a lot of great stuff. Right. But it doesn't often seem like it translates back to, well, we're back in the Monday afternoon meeting and it's status quo again. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's. <clears throat> One of the things that I, I actually talk about it in the book, and I do, I work on it <clears throat> more uh, lab uh, in a more elaborate fashion. But basically, I talk about some how energy flows and changes sometimes. And the idea is that right from the beginning, it ought to start rising up, and then stay high all the way through until you actually get results from it. I mean, that's kind of the ideal. But there's a couple of other very common ways that energy goes, and and you've named one of them, and I call that one the Big Bang approach to change. And so we have the thing, we got the golf shirts, we got the coffee mug, we got, you know, and we had a great time, all that meal, all that, hey, don't get me started about how good the, you know, all of that. And then nothing happens. I mean, it just, I mean, and I was telling that story uh, in, a, in a large company as I was working on the model and people started laughing. And I said, so I'm not exaggerating. They said, this happens every week on something different. I mean, think of the waste 
yeah. of that. I mean, and you can have those big events that, that could be amazingly helpful if you harness that energy somehow. Uh, so that Big Bang approach is a huge one. The second one is imagine that the energy <clears throat> doesn't get very high. It's just kind of kind of goes along kind of on a dotted line kind of thing in and out. And I call it a change on life support, that there's enough energy that people will go to the meetings, but you're not going to get their A game. I remember walking right before the pandemic, walking into a meeting with an executive. And I said, so what are you guys doing? And he said, uh, this is one of the things where we fill out some forms, we, we rearrange some priorities, and then, then we get out of here by four. I mean, it was just, it wasn't like, hey, we're making a decision that we could have an impact on the lives of people. It's none of that. It was just, and that's what, if you're getting life support kind of stuff, people are going, what's the minimum thing I could do? I remember a CEO saying to me one time, he said, all I was getting from the group was malicious compliance just enough so I would keep moving on down the hall and then people could go back to doing their regular work. And so it can really, if you're not careful, it can look like you're making progress while well, we're holding the meetings. Gee, we're in page 172 of our plan. Well, are you making progress while well, we're on page 172? No, no, no. Are you, you know, so. Yeah, I, I, I know all about, I don't, I don't know that it's malicious, but I know all about uh, sort of minimum compliance. I, I spent about a dozen years working in the competitive electricity industry. And so oh. incumbent natural monopoly utilities are, are regulated and uh, enforced effectively to enable competition where, where it's become legal by following a bare minimum prescription of, of standards and uh, interaction. Yes. Uh, data structures, things like that. But you know, they, they just sort of spit out garbage. They check the box, they've done their deal, but there's no real emphasis on, on shared success or really a focus more importantly on the, on the end consumer, the client. Yeah, and, that, and, you know, and one of the things I talk about uh, these days is that end, that end product, that end service often isn't even part of the plan. I remember talking to a leader, I think it's in, she was in Switzerland and I was going through my model and at right after implementation, where you took the plan and you, you, know, you put in the software, people got the training, uh, then comes you're actually getting value from it. She said, we don't go there. She said, we measure the implementation. Did it come in on time, on budget? Uh, did we get the bugs out of the system? She said, obviously, all that's really important, but we never measure, did we get value out of it? And so a lot of organizations have, I mean, put a lot of effort into things that end up crossing the finish line but but you know who can, everybody went home i mean there's no, nothing gone on so it's <laughs> yeah yeah right how important are, are the appropriate success criteria yeah. just thinking back to something i saw from a coach this morning of you know did you did you go to the gym and, and get an effective workout or were you at the gym for two hours right <laughs> it's like you're walking around with your towel and your cell phone and and you know saying hi to people but did you did you get your workout well i was at the gym for two hours that's right. <laughs> well, I, so, uh, can so I tell I you a hiking? Can I tell you a hiking story or not? Oh, I love hiking stories. All right. So uh, I, we were talking before. One hike that I've loved doing, and I want to do it again, is is the Grand Canyon rim to rim. And it's uh, for people who don't know, the Grand Canyon is a big canyon, and it's on the north rim is about eighty five hundred feet, and if you hike down to about thirty three hundred feet, you've just gone about a mile descent and you get to the Colorado River you cross and then you go up about four fifths of a mile to the south rim and that whole trail depending on which trail you use is 23 to 24 miles so it's hot uh, a lot of miles and a lot of changes in elevation and so I wanted to do it and I wanted to do it in you know in under 24 hours and so I was uh, thinking about it and one of my clients said oh you know Mark Lambert. And I go, yeah, I had the guy in a couple of classes. He said, he lives out there. He's done it with people and he's actually come up with a way to train for it. So I called him and he said, well, let me ask you what your, your goal is. He said, let me just tell you how to do it unsuccessfully. He said, you could, he said, I think you know this, but you could die. And he said, a lot of people don't carry enough water or electrolytes and, uh, you know, or a lot of people just, you know, everything, everything breaks down. And he said, there've been people who have had to be airlifted out. And, so, and he said, I don't think you want any of those. And I go, right. He said, all right, three ways to do it successfully. 
He said, the first way is you make it in under 24 hours. But by the time you get to that south rim, you have no energy left. You just fall over, you know, uh, you know, sort of figuratively, but I mean, you just, you've had it. He said, that's one way, but you can say, yeah, I did it in a day. The second one is you're in shape, you're doing it well, but you're really nervous about your footing because there's a lot of places where you're going down a pretty steep grade and going up a pretty steep grade. And you're worried, like, what, what if I trip? I mean, that's a pretty big fall right down there. <clears throat> and he said, so you spend the entire time looking at your feet. And what you miss is the Grand Canyon. And he says, which is one of the most spectacular places uh, you know, on earth, Rick, if you don't get a chance to look at it while you're hiking. And he said, so that's the second way to do it. He said, the third is you're in shape and you've done enough practice going at, you know, up and down hills that you're co confident in your ability to walk on you know, uneven terrain and that. And, he's, and I said, I'll take option three. And he said, okay, good. Here's what you need to do to train for it. And so I did. And, and I was able to do it successfully a couple of times. Uh, I mean, not in a day, a couple of times, but, but what I loved about that, and this is what I use when I'm talking to clients is be really specific about that end goal. Like, you know, what's just getting across the finish line? Because my hunch is you're going to put a lot of energy into something that may not be all that valuable for anybody. But then maybe you just want to go, I don't care if I see the scenery this time. We just want to get, and maybe that's okay. But be clear. And so everybody knows that's where we're headed for. And it just, I found, I found it to be a really, really great, for me at any rate, great analogy of, all right, what am I looking for when I'm doing this kind of thing? Yeah, a great example of a, of a clear goal, clear objective, maybe the, the plan of attack to get to that objective changes yes. over time. Maybe maybe it was different between your first and your and your second one at it. Yeah. How is it, uh, given that you, for rim to rim, or I know some people even do rim to rim to rim, and you have a time goal on this thing, so 24 hours, so yeah. some of the time you're, you're walking, it is dark. How, how was the time at night different for you and your experience than during the day? Well, yeah, I did it uh, in 13 hours. Um, oh, wow. So, okay. uh, no, should have gone rim to rim to rim. I can't, I'll tell you another story about maybe once we're off the air about a guy who was doing that and he kind of collapsed. But um, the um, you have to start in the dark. Uh, first of all, you're trying to stay out of the heat as much as possible. Uh, and it's it's impossible to not be in the heat. You, you're gonna hit the river, which is completely exposed, lots of rocks on the south side at early afternoon. So it's just, but you wanna minimize all that. So leaving in the dark, it's very helpful. So I left in the dark, but the sun was off in the distance enough that I could still see very well. I didn't need my headlamp. But then at night, um, I coming, coming up the south room, it actually has a really nice trail. But I had my headlamp on, uh, and it was it was really it was fine. Uh, my wife actually we were, we were able to have cell contact at that point, and she called me and she said, "Rick, look up," because she, <laughs> she she said the moon is hitting off the north rim wall, and I was so here you know there's no reason no technical reason for doing it, but other I get I kind of get blinders on and I'm moving here I am in the Grand Canyon I ought to be looking around. And so I stopped and I go, whoa, that's gorgeous. And she said, you're welcome. <laughs> and I kept going. But so I wasn't, I wasn't risk doing any risky hiking in the dark, but I was prepared. I had a good uh, kind of miner's helmet and all that kind of stuff. So nice. The, the three ways that you mentioned that you could succeed, the objective of simply reaching the distance, right? And, and yeah. the first one you mentioned, sort of getting there, you know, fully spent, maybe not enjoying the experience. It, it, yeah. just, it strikes me that you mentioned sort of the energy in that and you mentioned the energy in corporate change. How much of, of uh, and we're also talking about objectives. We're talking about yeah. metrics with your Swiss, I think it's Swiss client, yeah, measurable yeah. things. So we, we can measure, you know, wattage and other forms of, of energy. But you also mentioned early on um, martial arts practice, Tai Chi, yes. Chi being energy. How, yes. how, how much of that has influenced your view on energy and in corporate uh, function? Um, that's a great question. Uh, a lot. Uh, it's, I thought this sound would be off. I apologize for that. Um, I 
will use the word energy interchangeably with support now. Because now when I'm talking about it, I'm really talking about energy being forward momentum. If there's enough energy to get the work done, kind of, kind of a full-throated, like, yeah, we've really got to do this and do it well. Um, in, in fact, I'll use it implementation. What I, what I say to clients, what you're looking for is, is there a sense of mastery? Just like a martial artist would be going through. And you never get it. People who really are masters never say that they're masters because there's always something to learn. But there's that, that goal toward that. You know, you can feel that kind of momentum, that movement. So energy, yeah, energy is absolutely core to the whole thing. Nice. Um, I love that fact, you. I, I was just going to mention that uh, for, for me, the way mastery that ended up in the title of this, of this podcast, the way mastery really became tangible or a word that embodied so much for me was the book. Uh, I think it's George Leonard, uh, oh, which, which was about his, his journey through Aikido. Yep. That was a hugely influential book. Uh, just as I was starting to uh, even think about resistance and that, and I was thinking about my own learning process, which led me to some other things. Yeah. I love that book. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, such a great way to think about it. The, and, and I like, I like that uh, interchangeable energy support momentum, that idea of versus the offsite where the big bang happens and the, the energy or the momentum, uh, is gone effectively coming back and energizing or, or creating sustained momentum between the Monday afternoon meeting week over week. Yeah. Well, what's um, the book I want to talk about. Uh, I do want to talk about one more epic adventure story before we, uh, before we break, but before we run out of your time, seizing moments of possibility, I just want to talk about where people can find that because I love the model you're using to make the book available. Cool. Um, yeah, the ebook version is free on my website. So you can just go to the homepage, which is rickmauer.com. And are people going to see the spelling of my name on your screen or anything anywhere? We'll, we'll get it up there. We'll get links to your website as well. <clears throat> okay. So it's, it's, there's no trickery. It's right there on the, the homepage. And it, you get the ebook for free. If you really want the paperback version or the audio book, which I recorded, you can go to Amazon and you can buy them. But my idea and my goal was to put out something that people could use easily and pass along to other people easily uh, without actually spending any money. Uh, I just, I really would like people to use it. Um, so that makes me very, very happy. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I love that you're doing it that way. And are you still active as a consultant as well? If, if that really sparks something with somebody and they want to engage with you? It, yes, the answer is yes, but it's, it's a, a far more focused these days. I, I, I love doing speaking, <clears throat> and it's all been virtual lately, but uh, that will change. But, but I love doing like a 60-minute, 90-minute thing. But I also like working with planning teams that say, we've got this big change, and we're really worried about energy or support or some, they're going to use some word like that. And we're concerned that something could go wrong this time. And so what I do is it's, it's very limited uh, coaching is I can teach them my stuff pretty quickly. Uh, and then I can kind of be on call. And uh, so, you know, I might be spending, you know, over the course of months, a matter of, you know, just a few days with them, uh, you know, or maybe just one meeting is enough. They, they got what they need. But my goal these days is not to be involved in a big project so that I'm the person who's there on Monday and leaves on Friday. I just don't want to do that. So, so yeah, the speaking and then the, uh, the, what I'm calling strategic work sessions where you come and you really roll up your sleeves to do some work using the models that we've been talking about. Fantastic. I, I love that from a scale perspective for yourself as a, as a business model, you know, not just trading, trading hours for dollars and, and, and for your clients, right? Their ability to really learn to fish on their own. You yes. know, as, a, as a consultant, I always think about how you work yourself out of a job or right? enable your, yes. your client to succeed on their own. So I, I love that approach. So if we, if we bundle all this up, you know, energy and, and self-improvement yes. and growth and resistance and, and fear, uh, we, we both love hiking and sort of epic yeah. adventures. You, you've, you've got a pretty big one under your belt. You mentioned briefly off, off air. I want to hear the story about your adventure to the Arctic Circle. Uh, okay. All right. Well, this was... Yeah. Uh, Do you mind? Would you, would you share that? Uh, no, I, no, I would love sharing it. 
Okay, I was coming up on a depressing birthday and birthdays that end in zero tend to depress me. And I had to do something to prove to myself that I wasn't that old. And I didn't know what to do. And I remember one Sunday morning, uh, my wife, Kathy, and I were reading the paper and having coffee. And there was this article. And as I'm reading it, I thought, this would be perfect. This, you know, and I'm getting excited about it. And I mean, I, by the time I got done with the article, I was so far along in the planning process. I thought, okay, uh, yeah, we could probably get a flight out of DC where I live and, and get to go to Fairbanks and probably charter a plane, a plane up and down. And I've already done the planning. I know what I'm gonna wear. And I said, Kathy, I said, I got it. I know what I'd like to do on my birthday. And she knew this was important to me. And she said, what? And I said, oh, you're gonna love this. Next February, what I'd like us to do is fly up to Fairbanks, charter a bush plane, go up into the Arctic Circle and take dog sleds out and camp out for two weeks. What do you think? <laughs> and her reaction was not unlike yours, other than if you could add in, and he's a crazy man, uh, you know, and I, I said, oh, it's, it's going to be great. And I'm on, on just talking about how brilliant this thing is going to be. And she said, Rick, there's a couple of things about me that you know, but you seem to have forgotten. And, that, and now we do a lot of outdoor stuff together. We just, uh, we just rafted the Grand Canyon last month uh, for eight days and we were hiking in Colorado in July. I mean, we, we really do outdoor stuff. <clears throat> she said, but there's a couple of things about me you don't seem to remember. And I said, yeah, what's that? She said, well, one, I don't like to be cold and I don't care for dogs. And so immediately I thought of these brilliant rebuttals. I thought, well, we're gonna have US Army Arctic gear which is good to 70 below Fahrenheit, uh, you know, and it's not supposed to get much below 50 below. So that'd be great. And, and the dogs, I mean, we're each going to have a team of dogs and it'll be so far out. They'll be so far out ahead of you. It's not, you're not going to see them. You know, these are my brilliant sales things. It's a, uh, you can tell why I wasn't in sales, but I remember an old timer in my field one time said, Rick, if you want to influence people, there are two rules you got to remember. Rule number one is shut up. And rule number two, never forget rule number one. So I shut up and Kathy said, look, I know this is an important birthday to you. And I also know that you could take it by yourself if you want to, and that might be fine. I'd like to find a way that maybe, you know, that, you know, I can commiserate or celebrate or do something with you, you know, so I'm willing to consider it. <clears throat> but she said, that can't be our vacation this year. You know, and I said, yeah, fair enough. That sounds great. So we did take the trip. She had a team of six. I had a team of six. We were out for eight nights. And to this day, he said, Rick, how was the trip? I go, oh, it's great. And he said, Kathy, how was the trip? She goes, it was okay. So, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> part of it, you know, my own excitement, I was, you know, I was looking at everything through, through, through the eyes of Rick Maurer. This is what I want. This is what, you know. Uh, and in some ways, that's okay. It's my birthday. And we're, we're used to, you know, doing things on our own if we want to do things on our own. But I really wanted to be there. And I was, you know, going into sales mode just was not the way to go there. So it was a... That's, that's, that's pretty epic. It's so interesting too. I mean, we, we, we do that so much everywhere in life, right? We, we, brain's going crazy, makes it tough to, to listen. Uh, hmm. it, you know, if you can really kind of calm down a little bit and listen authentically and really hear what's coming through from the other person. Wow. You know, how much communication does that open up? So the one, just one question I have for curiosity, right? I've, I've got a zero birthday coming up and looking at doing something fairly, fairly crazy and epic. And my wife also sort of looks at me like, what's wrong with you? Uh, you know, so just tying back to energy, those, uh, those big sort of milestone birthdays and doing something epic like that. How did that, was it a big bang? Did you kind of have this great experience up in Alaska or did that come back and translate into where you re-energized for life when you got home? Hmm. I, it, first of all, it's a good experience. Um, the odd thing about it is we, we love the guides. Our main guide, his brother and his dad had both won the Iditarod, which is this major race from Anchorage up to, to Nome. And when we got back to uh, Anchorage, we were in a couple of places talking to people. And they said, who'd you go out with? And we, sent out, we went out with Bill Mackey. And it would be like saying, I live in the DC, Baltimore area, said, oh yeah, we went out with Cal Ripken. I mean, it was like, it was like, whoa. 
you went out with Bill, well, his dad, you know, his brother, I mean, it was just amazing. And he was great. And the other guy, a couple of the other clients with us, we just didn't get along with. They were just, uh, and I'll just tell you real quick, the one guy, uh, he knew a lot about Arctic exploration in the early days, which was interesting stuff, but he would never shut up about it. And so one night he's talking about it, we're by around the campfire, and he talks about a place called uh, Wrangel Island, which is a huge island between uh, the Soviet Union and Alaska. Mm -hmm. And he starts talking about it. And Kathy says, oh, Rick's great uncle was an explorer and was lost there, which is true. I was named after the guy. My first name's Frederick. And this guy goes, oh, OK, that's interesting. All right, so as I was saying, and Kathy said, that's why I don't like this guy. She said, you might have actually been able to tell him something that might have been interesting and not something he just read in a book. And there was a lot of that, but, but being out on the trail, that was great. I've never done anything like that before or since. Uh, it didn't make me go, wow, I wanna start dog sledding. I mean, it just, but it was, it was just, it was a, I, yeah, it was just a fascinating trip. I, I loved it. Yes, so much amazing stuff comes out of travel, just the experiences and, and the people and the, and the stories. So thank you for, for sharing all those. and. Thank you for, for what you're doing with the book. Again, seizing moments of possibility, but offering it up for free on your website, which again, we'll get, we'll get links to. And of course, if somebody really wants a paperback version, I'm, I'm definitely like a read it and put notes in the margin kind of guy myself. Yeah, me too. Uh, out on Amazon, which we'll, we'll get links up to on, on that as well. And most yeah. importantly, you know, I, I love this, this, uh, this conversation that we have on this show. It's all about sort of actionable advice, real world. How can I go back and use it? And really love what you shared today about going back to an organization, making an effect and an impact as a, as a leader, especially through change, which it's all around us the last couple of years, yes, right? Nothing yeah. but change. So thank you so much for your time oh. and your insight, Rick. Great stuff. This, this is a real pleasure, Michael. Pleasure's yeah. all mine. Thank yeah. you again. Thank you.